Bachelor of Sciences here at the uh, College of Arts and Sciences at BU. And uh, honored and a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Um, a couple of quick announcements before we get started. This is the uh, final lecture in the Discovery Series for the year. Uh, on the third year of what's proven to be quite a nice, successful series of events. And so it's nice to have folks turn out uh, and uh, engage in the community a little bit more and hopefully extend the BU learning experience to the rest of your lives and careers. Um, along those lines, I want to make a quick note here. We're doing something a little bit new and original. We're trying to experiment this year, um, which is that even though the academic year is ending, uh, we're doing something that we're calling uh, Alumni College, uh, which is designed to be uh, an immersive educational experience designed for alumni uh, to come and actually live on campus, participate, and engage in classes, and uh, sort of reignite those inquisitive energies that you had from your student days. Uh, the topic for this year's Alumni College is uh, something we're calling sustainability city, so it's going to be somewhat related to some of the topics that Professor Phillips is going to be talking about tonight, and, and he's participating in that event as well. Uh, so I would encourage you all to think about it and participate. I think we have a short promotional video for your education. So we'll take it away. experience isn't behind you. It continues at Boston University's Alumni College. The BU Alumni Association presents Alumni College 2011, Sustainability in the City. A robust three-day program that provides an immersive educational experience. You'll learn what it means to live sustainably in all facets of life. You'll meet faculty experts who will discuss emerging trends, and you'll have a chance to walk the halls and live on campus once again. It's more than just lectures. It's field trips, lab experiences, and classroom discussions. And it's a joyous return to the city you know and love during the best time of the year. Be a part of the Alumni College Class of 2011. Continue your pursuit of lifelong learning and experience sustainability in the city. All right, so hopefully that got you guys excited. Uh, and certainly tell your fellow alums uh, who you think might be interested. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's sort of a nexus of a lot of actual incoming like, research and curriculum development at the college. So uh, it's going to be a lot of, a lot of fun and interesting. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to um, give a short introduction to our speaker tonight, who is Professor uh, Nathan Phillips from East from the Department of Geography and Environment. He's also the director of our Center for Energy and Environmental Studies. Uh, Nathan is kind of an interesting guy. He comes to us with a background in undergraduate physics and then uh, converted, I guess is the term, and he's, he's an ecologist now by training. He did his PhD at the Duke School for the Environment. Um, and his, he works on a variety of different things here. Space training as a plant physiological ecologist, uh, global change biologist, and more recently he's become very engaged as an emerging leader in this field of sustainability, urban sustainability, urban ecology, and what we're calling urban metabolism. Um, Nathan is also kind of a remarkable guy because he really uh, practices what he preaches in the sense that. Um, if you look closely on combat, rain, snow, hail, sleep, hurricane, you'll see Nathan out on his bike. He's a, he's a devoted zero carbon person. And uh, a few years ago, still trying to do it a little bit, uh, has his office set up to be zero carbon. He's got a little generator. He runs off of a bicycle in his office, no lights. It's, it's a pretty impressive setup. Um, so uh, a lot of respect for him because really trying to live what he preaches. Um, also, as a friend and a colleague, I've known Nathan for, when did you join us? 2000. 
Street in, in 2000, so I've known Nathan for over a decade, and he's really one of the nicest people and the best colleague you'll ever, you'll ever have, and also a very engaging speaker. And so with that introduction, I'll pass it off to Nathan. Hope you enjoy the show. Thank you for coming, Mark. Thanks for the great uh, introduction. Caitlin, uh, thank you for coming to this. And really thank you guys, the alumni, for coming out on this uh, kind of overcast evening. And uh, my friend John here, just outside, said, you know, he didn't know that my expertise was in the arena of food. And actually, he's right. I don't, you know, I don't really have the expertise in, in that. I'm a tree guy, as, as uh, Mark said. And um, so, Food is such a big topic to kind of get your mind around that, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, doing a lecture on water or something. There's so many facets to it. So I'm going to come to you with a perspective as a, as a tree guy, okay? So trees are icons of sustainability, okay? Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm going to be talking with you about fruit trees and, and apples. So that's my connection to, to food. But uh, trees are kind of, for me, like uh, you know, the white whale was for Melville. It's my lens for looking at issues of sustainability and resiliency. And so we'll be talking about that. Anyone know what this uh, particular tree might be? A fruit tree. It's an apple tree. It's a wild apple tree from, from Turkey. So uh, I want to walk through with you and, and give you, I'm also a geographer, uh, even though I've never had a class in geography in my life. I, I call myself a geographer now, a biogeographer. So we're going to go on a little journey here of biogeography. We're going to go across 5 million years, and we're going to go across different parts of the globe and trace the apple. And so we'll start off talking about uh, the evolutionary origins, how we took this wild plant and domesticated it, and into the modern era, what we've done to industrialize apple production. And, and as we go through this five million year process and a globalization process, I want to kind of ask, is this something that in this time period, do we, has this advanced sustainability for us? Are we taking a step back? Uh, what does this story uh, tell us about our relationship with food and our food supply systems? So let's start off uh, just in terms of origins. And if you ever get a chance to, uh, you know, go on one of those eco tours, this would be a place I would recommend. Even though I haven't been there, but the more I've read about it, it's like the Garden of Eden, Eden, in a sense that this place is the center of origin for many of the fruit trees that we know about: pears, uh, apricots, and wild apples. So it's here in the Xiantan uh, Mountains that are right on the border of Kazakhstan and China where if you go there even today, and even to the settled areas, the towns, wild apples are growing up through the pavement, okay? And then you have forests, apple forests. You know, we think about orchards, but these are wild forests. And this is where things started uh, for the apples. So this is what a, a natural apple forest looks like um, in, in that area of, of Kazakhstan. And here's just a little bit of a, a shot of the, the landscape around that area taken from Orion Megan, you can probably see there's an apple tree there on the, the left. You can barely see the, the fruits there. Okay? And if you go into that area, the people that have been there talk about the, the amazing fragrances that they experience walking through there and the tremendous amount of diversity that uh, is seen in, in really each and every apple tree. They're all different. They're all quite different. They span a, a, a huge range. Um, and and so that's a really interesting facet of these apples. It turns out uh, that apples don't breed true. The, the term is they don't breed true in that, um, you know, a seed from an apple tree, you pick an apple off a tree, you plant that seed, the apples that that would produce won't look anything like the parent apple, okay? Um, it's, it's as if we were having all the kids that we would have would, would look nothing like us. So they're, these apples contain a tremendous amount of diversity, a bank of diversity within them that expresses themselves in this tremendous way. It's just a diverging kind of uh, genetic species. So this area is a 
uh, repository for genetic diversity, a huge repository for genetic diversity. And it poses a really interesting question, which is domestication. The apples that we get in the market now, we're not getting that kind of variability. So how did we kind of control that wild divergence and that, that biodiversity? Um, so, so this moves to the, the topic of domestication. So Malus severcii is the wild uh, genus and species, the Latin, and the Malus domestica, uh, you can see there, is, is what we have for our domesticated apples. So all the varieties that we see in the supermarket are, are varieties of that Malus domestica. So how did we get there? And this is what I call the first genetically modified crop in that at some point in the distant past, we learned how to manipulate nature uh, by grafting. And what we could then do is to breed true it, in the sense that when we found good juicy apples, okay, we could take cuttings from that tree and graft it onto other rootstocks and then it would produce the same apple as the one we had uh, picked off of that tree. And so if you think about that, all of the apples that we eat in the store today are actually clones that, whose cuttings have been propagated uh, over many, many generations on the rootstocks that go all the way back to the first time that a seedling of that apple was grown and someone found out, oh, that was really a tasty apple, okay? Um, so it's a really amazing aspect of, of apples. And, and this is an aspect of agriculture that I find very fascinating. Jerry Diamond's thesis about uh, guns, germs, and steel is that agriculture uh, and everything that uh, derived from that in terms of technological civilization uh, was not invented. It was unconsciously evolved from places where we settled and berries that we ate and happened to drop. We, we performed selection uh, kind of unconsciously. That's the idea and thesis he has for agriculture. But this kind of innovation, um, to me, it's hard to imagine other than an invention. Okay, and this is a really interesting aspect of humans learning about the control of nature. And, you know, us, in terms of humans going from a, you know, the, the, the transition from hunter-gatherers to a agrarian, sedentary society from which you know, our, our civilization uh, derived. You know, you think about the, the, the creation myth in the Judeo-Christian Abrahamic religions about the Garden of Eden. And some scholars have, have thought of that as really the, the movement from, of humans from the state of nature uh, into the uh, toiling in the fields and basically Agriculture. So I know that's kind of an out there speculation, but really that that uh, religious text is is something that goes back to the very you know near to the start of our recorded history of Western civilization, if you will. And so there's there's that uh, interesting kind of connection there. And, and of course, uh, many artists uh, like Titian there and others have. Uh, you know, put the tree of the knowledge of the good and bad as the apple tree. Um, and uh, evolutionary biologists tell us that if there was such a Garden of Eden and it was in Persia or uh, Iraq in that area, it probably wasn't an apple, it was probably a pomegranate. So a lot of these paintings reflect the, uh, essentially, the, the, the apple and its meaning to the, the cultures that were making these uh, uh, paintings. And so the spread of, of that apple um, went along with the Silk Road here. And so you can just see the, the spread going from about 3,000 years ago to about 1,000 years ago, that overall kind of time period there. And, and again, you can see that you see that solid line and there's various branches of the Silk Road. You can see the Tian Shan uh, Mountains right there. Uh, the pointer, but you can see it right there. Um, up here, right? So, so this is the area in which there was wild apple forests growing, and, and clearly this was a route for the spread of that um, apple. Now, let's fast forward and bring that spread, you know, to 
very close to home actually. So you probably know where this is. This is the Boston uh, Common there on the, the right. And I don't know, I can't see what that street name there is there, but you kind of know where we are, right? See that plaque there on the left, okay? Um, just on the side of that building? That commemorates, and you can check it out, it's 50 Beacon Street, if you ever want to go down there. Here's the plaque, Reverend William Laxton. And uh, he actually planted the first or apple orchard in North America in 1623, okay? So his name is also spelled Blackstone with B-L-A-C-K-S-T-O-N-E, so you can find that name in, in both of those. So we have a, a really founding history here in Boston, not just in Massachusetts, in Boston, uh, with the apple. And cuttings were brought over from uh, Britain. Um, in the 1630s, the first named variety of apple uh, in the North America is, anyone care to guess what this apple is called, variety? Roxbury Russet, right. And as you can see, it's, you know, it's got some character, right? And part of our issue with apples is that whether we are willing to embrace the idiosyncrasies of each of these you know, unique uh, apples. But uh, I haven't had this apple, but I understand that it's a, it's a very uh, tasty apple. And it's, it's, it's more than just a sweetness. It's, a, it's got a very nice taste to it. And in fact, today we have some of these Roxbury russets growing. So here down in uh, Roxbury, uh, at the Shirley Eustis house. Has anyone, anyone been to that house? I haven't been there, but in, I think, 1994, uh, five of these Roxbury russets were grown. So it's a, it's a you know, somewhat rare variety of apple, but it's still here. And again, it's a clone that goes back at least to the 1630s. It's really like the same plant. It's, you know, a cutting from one plant onto rootstock cutting from that plant. It's like your starter yeast for uh, sourdough bread. It just keeps going, okay? Really amazing uh, kind of immortality of the uh, apple. And there's a picture just from Google uh, Street View. Somehow the uh, thing in the center got uh, stitched together weird, but you can see the, uh, the apples. And if you go there, they also have other uh, plants that are uh, other fruit trees and things like that. So. Um, in preparing for this talk, I looked this up. I haven't been there. I really want to go there um, you know, soon. And so as part of that movement into the United States, we have uh, John Chapman, otherwise known as Johnny Apples. Anyone know where he was from? Where he derived from? Lemonster. Lemonster, yes. So he's a local, local person. Um, and here's a really interesting aspect of him. So apple seed. We've just been talking about how, really, to get the, the apples, the varieties, you want to you want to graft cuttings, right? So you get the same apple. Whereas he was going and just, you know, going to places that were about to be settled and planting orchards from seed. Um, there's some uh, reason to believe that it could have been a kind of a religious, spiritual uh, perspective he had that. Uh, he didn't want to be manipulating nature uh, in, in such a way as, as grafting. Um, but the other thing that made him very successful was that even though when you plant from seed, probably 90 times out of 100, you're going to get a very small, uh, bitter, um, not juicy tasting apple, there's still value in those apples. Does anyone have an idea of what that might be? Alcohol. Yeah, hard cider. Okay, and so. So that's where Johnny Appleseed has this kind of Dionysian, you know, I'm not saying that right, uh, kind of uh, legend associated with him because he was spreading apples, but he's also essentially bringing hard cider out to uh, the, these colonies. Okay? And, and, and the other byproduct, as I said, 90 out of those 100 are going to be bad, okay? not tasty, not desirable. But 10 out of those 100, or maybe a 1 out of 100, uh, are going to be winners. And so that's where an explosion of great apples came from. A part of that was him just, you know, um, basically planting all of these different seeds. So the apple, there's five carpels, there's five chambers, uh, so there's five sets of seeds in each apple. Um, and each one of those, even from the same apple, will turn out to be completely distinct. Okay, so it, it, the, again, that genetic diversity is, is quite amazing. So that's a bit.
bit about how we got domesticated this thing. And then we moved in, you know, kind of the late 1800s to early 1900s with really the industrialization uh, of the apple that really it was in pace with industrialization of agriculture in general. And we really, we moved from 16,000 named varieties in the last four centuries to about uh, 15 that we have that are, uh, that occupy about, or take up about 90% of the U.S. market for apples. Okay, so a massive shrinking of diversity, and and it says something about us as as you know how we deal with diversity. Maybe it's too many choices. Uh, you know, maybe a restricted set of choices in the market helps us out. Um, but also the appearance and what we have come to expect in terms of uniformity of the products that we consume. So you know, this is kind of like you know McApple and and the, the idea that you want something that really is predictable and you can kind of count on being the same, you know, I think a lot of these things play into uh, the industrialization. So I just mentioned this uh, this shrinking of diversity, and I want to, um, anyone read The Botany of Desire, uh, the book by Michael Paul? You get, this, you get the idea there about the, the, the trade-offs that we've made uh, in terms of industrialization, the loss of genetic diversity uh, that has brought us, you know, it goes hand in hand with the, uh, the uniformity that we've uh, come to expect and the efficiencies of scale, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, that starts to connect the concept of sustainability with resilience and safety of our food supply. So those things uh, go hand in hand. The first food revolution, you could say, was really the emergence of agriculture around 10,000 years ago. The movement from hunter-gatherers to uh, sedentary uh, agrarian-based society. What I call the second food revolution was really at, in pace with the industrial revolution, the mechanization, uniformity, efficiency, and economies of scale that were related to all industrial processes. And uh, I don't want to pick necessarily on this one person, Frederick, Frederick Taylor, but the principles of scientific management spelled it out really in a way that 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 kind of uh, informed and, 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 and influenced all kinds of industrial processes. Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Okay, and, and really, you know, sustainability is partly about efficiency. Like, for instance, efficiency reduces carbon footprints, right? More energy efficient. Um, but there's a trade-off with efficiency, and sometimes things that are very more and more efficient can have some uh, developing vulnerabilities. So we've talked about the origins, we've talked about the domestication, we've talked about the industrialization. Let's, let's connect this a little bit more with implications for, for food sustainability. In 2007, there was a little flurry of media attention uh, from a paper that was uh, published um, about the carbon footprint associated with apples from grown in New Zealand and shipped to Europe, okay? And so, uh, at the time in Britain, there was uh, a movement about local food and thinking about the concept of food miles, how far food has to travel. And so in New Zealand, some researchers at Lincoln University said, wait a minute, um, let's really add up all of the costs associated with growing apples, uh, the, the uh, inputs in terms of energy, irrigation, uh, pesticides, fertilization, everything and add in the cost of shipping it from New Zealand to Britain. And when they did that, they ended up with a result that, uh, and this made it to the New York Times as well, I patched that in the wrong way, um, that the carbon footprint of New Zealand apples in Britain was lower than Britain, British grown apples in Britain, okay? And so that kind of threw a monkey wrench in ideas about sustainability, the benefits of, of local food, and that kind of thing. So, how many people heard about that argument? I mean, this was a prominent uh, opinion piece in the New York Times, but so a few of you have heard about that. So I actually, in preparation for this talk, I, I wanted to go back and look at the source of, of that, and here is the source of that. Uh, so it, it's a paper, I, you know, I tell my students all the time, read the peer-reviewed article from which popular press comes and, and look at the details. Um, and so I looked at this 
Um, and you know, I, I think it, it it leaves a bit to be desired here. Um, and and uh, you know, for example, this is not a peer-reviewed publication, so it's kind of an in-house white paper here that was produced uh, by this uh, Lincoln University and the Agribusiness and Economics Research Unit, which itself, as you can see there, has funding from a variety of sources, including museum companies and organizations. I don't necessarily mean that that absolutely corrupts their research, but I think it is something to, to bear in mind in terms of um, you know, their, their particular interest in, in publishing uh, this. And without going into a great amount of detail here, if you start digging down into the details, you realize that coming up with a, a total life cycle carbon footprint is so difficult for almost anything. You know, what you consider to be external to a process versus, versus internal um, is very debatable. Okay? In, in this particular case, for British apples, they added in for every apple a six month period in which it was stored close to freezing temperatures. Okay? Because in the off season, people still want to eat apples. And for the British apples to be stored that long, they need to be in very controlled atmospheric and thermal conditions. And there are energy costs associated with that. Okay? So, you know, in, in some ways it wasn't a apples to apples comparison. I mean they were they were comparing apples uh, from New Zealand shipped to Britain in the, the off season for Britain. And it would have been interesting to compare you know, British apples during the growing season with, uh, you know, against the uh, New Zealand apples um, at that time. So I, I want to, oh, I just mentioned one other thing. New Zealand, it, a lot of their energy inputs to their orchards were derived from hydropower, okay? And hydropower can be done well, and it can be done in a way that's not great for the environment in some cases. And I didn't look through those, that level of detail, but that, it just illustrates there's lots of trade-offs. Britain, all of the energy use was attributed to coal-fired plants. Okay, so, so these are some of the things that uh, came into play. I want to go back and, and revisit the tree because I want to dig a little bit deeper and go um, you know, beyond the fruit itself that we've talked about. And you know, for me, trees represent a, a you know, kind of the gold standard of a sustainable and resilient infrastructure system. It's a distribution system. And if you think about the tree, and it, it kind of sets up a, a, a thing where we can compare our human systems with that. If you think about the most active parts of that organism, it's at the very terminal ends, okay, the leaves. And they're consumers, I mean, they're consuming from that whole system. They're consuming water and some nutrients, but they're all producing, too. They're sending back into the grid, if you will, okay? And at below ground, the fine roots, they're also consumers. They're consuming the sugars uh, from the, the, the leaves, but they're also gathering resources to feed back into the network. Okay? And um, I've studied tree, the insides of trees, and you see how trees negotiate these trade-offs between uh, efficiency and resilience. Uh, uh, and, and so this is the cross-section of a red oak tree, which is common in, in, in this area. And these big holes here, this is, this is like a, a, as if you cut the uh, stump and you're looking down at it. So these holes would be coming, going straight up vertically. And these represent one, two, three, four, five different growing seasons. Okay, so there's a, those growth rings. And those big vessels, those big tubes, they conduct water at such an enormously higher rate than uh, the smaller tubes. But for a half-sized tube, it's 1 16th as much flow. That's the physics of how water moves through these pipes. But look at what's going on here. They've balanced efficiency and safety. If the, those, those big vessels, they're actually much more vulnerable to failure, okay? Like freezing really knocks those big ones out. The trees build these backup systems. They're the smaller ones. They're much less efficient. Okay, but they can, it's been found, research has shown that um, they can be reactivated, they can be activated when there's failure in these bigger uh, vessels. So trees have kind of hedged their bets, and different species of trees do it in, in different ways. They're, they're both trying to be efficient, but they've got the safety and backup system. Okay, it's got some costs associated with it, um, and so it, it illustrates the trade-offs that biology 
has to deal with. And, and in fact, uh, you know, I, I was very happy to see that, you know, I'm not crazy to be thinking about trees as, as metaphors or, 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 or standards by which to prepare our human infrastructural system. So you see here people have been thinking about how, how networks uh, might be uh, similar or different uh, than the kinds of distribution systems we see in nature. So when we, I think about, by and large, our human distribution systems, you know, we're basically consumers. We're con it's a consumption network um, that we have, and you know, it's kind of like you know, these are we're burning energy, by and large, with some exceptions, at the terminal ends of our network. We're not really uh, feeding back uh, into that grid. So here's where I get a little bit of a, a science geek. I, I model trees like this. I, 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 you know, from my physics background, I guess I think about these circuits you know, that flow through these resistors. And most of our infrastructural, our, our, our resource delivery systems are really these one-way flow networks. They go through big pipes, and those go to smaller pipes. They have some resistance, and they go to smaller pipes, and they go down to our homes. And that is a place where we use and degrade. Now, this could be water, this could be food, this could be natural gas, it could be electricity. Um, and, and, that, that's, and we aggregate. And this is part of the efficiencies of scale. If you buy milk, you know, the milk is, is gathered into these big giant uh, tubs and, and aggregated. Or our, our big giant natural gas systems, or Quabbin Reservoir, we, we um, you know, aggregate and then send out on these things. And, and by putting a premium on efficiency and economies of scale, we start to lose uh, connections. Uh, to these resources, that we start to lose what I think of as the, the knowledge networks that should be associated with those resource delivery networks. And so what happens is that we have knowledge gaps. And so we see these kinds of articles from time to time. In this school district, people knew about the fact that there were these tainted burritos. They knew about it well in advance of the kids in the school actually eating those burritos. It's just that the communication system, the social networks, were not uh, you know, up to speed with what the experts knew at the time. So we see this kind of thing. We see it, uh, you know, in our own area. You guys might have seen this uh, this issue with the two year out of date food that was uh, served in our Boston area school, schools and, and even a, a bit further than that. And so, again, here's what we have, you know, as, as a paradigm for our delivery systems. If we can then even think about this not just with food. Uh, we had that big failure of our water system on May 1st of last year. It was a single pipe uh, that burst, a 10-foot pipe. It was actually quite close to where I live in Newton. And uh, that the whole system went down uh, when that occurred. I actually took a picture of that since I was so close to it. This is the Charles River going this way, and this is this new river, 8 million gallons per hour, dumping into the Charles River shortly after that, uh, that single pipe burst. And so I actually went to the MWRA website to, to, to see, well, what do they think about issues of resilience okay, in, in the delivery system? And in their most recent report on their long range plan, their performance measure definition and threshold and then their analysis of resilience for the entire water network, uh, they said this was before the failure. No impact, 100%. Resiliency was defined as the quab and reservoir spending 18 or less consecutive months below a certain height. So it's not on their radar to, to consider redundancy and resilience built into the physical infrastructure of the water system. It's, resilience it, to them is completely related to the level of the water in quab and reservoir, uh, which may actually change into the future. So uh, just to continue to broaden this concept from food to water to natural gas as part of our uh, Boston Urban Metabolism Project. We're starting to look at the natural gas system uh, in Boston. We're finding that that's a system that's not even efficient. So these are our drive around Google Maps that show the, the amount of leaks that are coming out, hundreds and hundreds of leaks in the city of Boston and thousands of leaks of methane gas being wasted into the atmosphere and damaging vegetation and trees. I'm on an auto, I guess I maybe I'll need to get off the stage here a little bit. Uh, 
So this was a conclusion of this, the, the natural gas uh, infrastructure report itself that uh, discusses issues of redundancy and interconnectivity uh, and the vulnerability of this system. So we're, we're actively working on this as part of our urban metabolism research as well. So how do we start to build resilience into our, our delivery system? And, and I think that what we need to do is, is to start to build uh, generation, re resource generation, at some modest scale across the different levels of our distribution networks. Okay, so right now, uh, you know, this, this stands for gardening or agriculture, and right now it's, we're about 95% of, of this, the big industrial factory farming. And if we can get to, to the point at the, at the household level, at the municipal level, at the state level, where we built a little bit of capacity, um, and I don't have illusions that, that home gardens could fulfill all of our, our, our food needs. No way, not in an urban area. It's just, it, it, it can't work. But if you can build in a little bit, let's say 5% um, here and 5% at other levels, we could start to balance our, and, and not have all of our eggs in one uh, basket, even if that's an efficient uh, basket with a very, you know, highest scale. And so again, food, water, uh, you know, we, if you saw in Tokyo recently, the water was not suitable for drinking because of the radiation. The bottled water ran out very quickly, um, and they didn't really have uh, the ability to, to capture local water. And, and if you think about what happened in May 1st here in Boston last year, what we did was we substituted one dependency for two others. When we ran out of the water and it stopped, we went straight to bottled water and we went to boiling water. And so, if you think about self-sufficiency, we weren't self-sufficient. We were. We live in a, a, a wealthy enough uh, society where we could we could make our way out of that. We didn't demonstrate uh, self-sufficiency. Now, here is. I know this is busy, but this is for me uh, in my geeky kind of way the the idea that we need to. We're awash in information. It's not just the physical flow <coughs> networks of water or food or or things like that. It's the information, the, the data collection, the cyber infrastructure, that's what the little I, information. We have the ability to monitor all of these flows, okay? But we also need people to be engaged at the different levels, policymakers down to you know, us consumers. Um, and, and we need to think about the communication of information from people um, and, and who knows what about our systems. What are the issues of security? Uh, versus right to know by consumers. In the natural gas explosion in San Bruno last fall, did the homeowners in that area deserve the right to know that there was this high pressure pipe that, that uh, exploded in their area? These are, these are tough questions, but I think we need to, uh, to think about those. Again, back to Boston, we had had a long legacy of, of really sustainability and, and a sense of civic duty. So, in 1942, uh, these Victory Gardens were established, and the last continuous existing one, some of you might know, is about a quarter mile away from us here in the Fenway Victory Gardens, okay? And so it wasn't just a statement of virtue. Um, this was a need. In World War II, at that time, demands for food exports to the nation's armed forces caused rationing and, and shortages for those back home in the States in response President Roosevelt called for Americans to grow more vegetables. The city of Boston established 49 areas, including the Boston Common and the Public Gardens, for this purpose. And, and so, yeah, it's, I think it's more than, than uh, a statement of virtue. And so I, I'm really proud to, uh, to be a supporter of a movement that has started just in the last few months. It's been uh, kind of uh, uh, percolating for, for about the last six months, and it's called the Boston Tree Party. And you know that's a play on the Tea Party thing, but it's, it's really, it's beyond politics. It's post-partisan, and this is about uh, sustainability that I think, you know, everyone can really uh, agree on. And I, I want to just uh, end with a little uh, uh, Radio Boston piece here um, that was about this launch and the first uh, pair, the idea of the Boston Tree Party is to plant 100 pairs of apple trees throughout the city. And you need to plant them in pairs so that they can cross-pollinate. 
that you better with the fruit set if there's if there's a mixture of pollen. And and so uh, the first pear was planted, endorsed by the city of Boston in the Rose Kennedy Greenway a, a few weeks ago. And uh, this is just a couple minutes of uh, that event. And briefly, while, while we're on the subject of green, there's a new nonprofit in town known as the Boston Tree Party. Not Tea Party, that's Tree Party. They're on a mission to plant 100 pairs of heirloom apple trees in civic spaces across Greater Boston. The inaugural tree planting took place at the Rose Kennedy Greenway this weekend, and our intern, Amory Sievertson, swung by to meet the team. Hello, and welcome to the Boston Tree Party inauguration. <laughs> I'm Lisa Gross. I'm the founder and chairman of the Boston Tree Party. The Boston Tree Party is a collaborative campaign to plant 100 pairs of heirloom apple trees in public use spaces across Greater Boston. And what we're doing is we're planting a decentralized public urban orchard that crosses social, political, economic, and geographic boundaries. And it's about the city really coming together in support of environmental and community health. I'm Michael Phillips. I come from northern New Hampshire, where I grow apples. And I've been invited to come down here to the Boston Tree Party as one of their two official pomologists. Uh, pomology is the study of tree fruits. We need to get people more just involved with simply walking by a tree and seeing, that's in flower. A month later, I walk by, there's a small fruit there. And not only that, but it happens to be a Roxbury russet, the first named variety in this country. It goes back to the early 1600s. It first grew here in Roxbury, part of Boston. The very first orchard was planted up on Beacon Hill. Those apple trees were put in the ground somewhere prior to 1625. Here we are today planting a new orchard almost 400 years later. We need to grow food in the places that we live. An apple tree can Okay, and I'll just add one thing to that, which is in, in the relationship, uh, the Center for Energy and Environmental Studies is an endorser of this uh, Boston Tree Party. And in fact, our role is to do research that layers onto this. So we're actually using that same genetic property of the apples. So of these 100 heirloom apples, there's going to be lots of clones, OK? Um, and what that does is it allows us to do research, uh, because these become bioindicators of the urban microenvironment, which we're, we're studying, and uh, you know, to, to allow us to use these to, to assess the differences in uh, carbon dioxide, air pollution, and these kinds of things. Um, so I will stop there and uh, answer any questions. Absolutely. I mean, for, for my talk today, you know, the, the lens to look at the world of apples, but definitely, I mean, um, diversity, biodiversity is, is, is we should, you know, we should, uh, that's something that we should promote. And so I think the Bartlett pear is, is local to, to Boston as well, right? And, and other fruit trees. So absolutely. about you you mentioned that you were going to be planting or this organization was going to be planting um, pears because you know they, they need each other to pollinate yeah. and I have seasonal allergies or had seasonal allergies and my son does too and I, I've heard and since you said in the beginning that you're sort of a tree expert um, is it true that um, or that you study trees yeah. um, is it true that you know, because I remember growing up not having so much pollen as we do now. And is it true that 
you know, landscapers and what have you, people in general, plant more male species than they do female, and, and the male pollinate more than females, and that's why we have more pollen? Or, is, you know? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that in terms of, of the kind of um, what nurseries are you know, planting in terms of the, the, the gender of the, of the plants. But that's a good point, and, and uh, I know, you know folks have pollen issues and uh, things like that. Uh, and, and so, you know, I hadn't really thought about that, to be honest. And so I, I think these are things that, uh, you know, we are worth thinking carefully about. Um, you know, I, I, I was wondering, you know, also you were saying how, you know, um, bugs and insects are, you know, understanding, and clearly maybe with pesticide, herbicide use, you know, it's another reason why, you know, trees or what have you are maybe pollinating more, I, I don't know, but um, anyway, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, you know. one thing that's clear is that the urban environment uh, makes plants grow <laughs> quite differently than a non-urban environment, and so one of our experiments as part of this urban metabolism metabolism, we're growing little oak seedlings on the roofs at Boston University, on a roof, and looking at it at, at the roof of Harvard Forest, which is in central Massachusetts. And the it's, it's not so much about how these little oak seedlings are growing, it's the weeds that, that are just exploding in the urban and not in the uh, in the rural area. It's the same soil. Um, so, so something is quite different. The plants are growing quite differently. And I there could be uh, associations with pollen. I, we, we are also working with someone who's studying ragweed across the same urban to rural gradient, and it's clear that there are differences uh, as well in that pollen, it, and its intensity in the urban area being higher. Really good point. Um, very good uh, discussion, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I live in a 200-something-year-old uh, house, and um, we've been interested in gardening in the past. And uh, one of the challenges that we had was um, uh, the house has a legacy of lead paint that um, uh, you know, uh, causes problems, I guess, uh, in various situations in planting uh, near the house. And I, I guess I'm just wondering, in an urban environment with uh, a long history like Boston, I would imagine that the, you know, whatever PCBs or whatever might be in the soil would be a consistent challenge with you know trying to grow food in, in, in that kind of a that kind of an environment and I guess I was just wondering your thoughts of whether nature finds a way to clean that stuff out or, or whether um, that would be in essence creating another health problem. Yeah great point. So the, the thing that impressed me so much about the Boston Tree Party was that I, I uh, Lisa Gross who is the mastermind of this thing, you know I was hitting her with question after question about one of the main ones being that, and she had thought it out, and, and they're very careful uh, not to provide these uh, apple trees to people who haven't tested the soil where they would want to plant it. And that's going to definitely restrict the places where these can be planted. And it's actually not seen as a place where you plop into a, a sidewalk on a busy street. Maintaining a tree, a fruit tree, in a, in a situation like that is going to be very, very difficult. The idea is civic places. They don't have to be public property, but they can be places where, like in front of a church, let's say, or you know, they can be private, but they're intended to be civic places uh, where people can make a commitment to uh, both know that the, the soil is, is, is clean and as well to actually commit to taking care of the tree. Because if you did this without, you know, really being careful, it could be a real disaster. I agree with that. I think also, though, in terms of the potential for the future, uh, the environmental contamination is definitely going to, as I said, limit. But I think we do have a lot of uh, potential for using our roofs, the rooftops. Here at Boston University, in fact, we're on the ninth floor, you know, if you just look out over the city and you see the blank, you know, slates that are on many of our roofs, we could be doing so much. You know, maybe it's growing little stuff like herbs or, but it could it could help. And they do, those green roofs also offer some ecosystem services like uh, stormwater regulation and moderating the, uh, the solar uh, loading that the, the 
buildings have to use energy to, uh, you know, to cool down and that kind of thing. So I think there's intention to remove it. Um, I'm getting a little bit overwhelmed because I feel like sometimes there's just so much going wrong in the world and it's hard to just wrap my mind around it and say, you know, what can we do to help? And we all do our own little bit, but it's, it's overwhelming. Um, um, okay, so one of my questions is just so basic, but red tape. Do you find yourself, especially in the city of Boston, where the rules are archaic and vegan mill is just, it's like one permit after another permit. How do you make, how do you make all this stuff happen? Are you, you know, butting up against a lot of um, paperwork and bureaucracy and then What's going on in the Boston Common? Is there is there an opportunity for an urban garden there? Can they, is there, and then, okay, so do you want me to ask another question? Or I might make sure, yeah, yeah. My other, my other concern is, I feel like um, throughout history, we're always coming up with this new innovation to help solve our problems. And so, and that's why half of these, half of these miserable things that we're into have happened in the first place. They were all well intended but it has just been a complete disaster in the end, hurting our planet, hurting ourselves, making us sick. So, it's even, even I'm thinking like the light bulbs. So they said, get these curly light bulbs, they're great, they'll help save the environment, but if they smash, you've got mercury poisoning. So we're inventing things to try to help, but are they really helping? And what, what do you see in your world, in your studies of things that that are helping and make a difference and, and won't come back to bite us in the end. Okay, good question. Yeah, I mean, I'll take the last one first, and um, I'm, I'm aware of this, it's called Jevons Paradox. It's like, uh, it's an economic thing. When, when things become more and more efficient, people tend to use more and more resources. So you get more gas mileage, you drive more. Or, you know, you get more efficient, you know, uh, energy in a house, you get a bigger house. So we have those tendencies, and those are, those are behavioral things. And, and I, I feel like uh, that's why, I mean, there's hope for us because there are, I mean, our behavior is mutable. I mean, we can change. I guess we can develop values that, you know, go away from those kinds of um, things. So I, I think that there, there is that possibility. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the red tape issue, I do feel like that is a, a big issue. I mean, to, to, to put out such a bold statement, like let's put a, a vegetable garden in Boston Common sounds uh, at one level like crazy, but at, at the White House they did it. I mean, and and in fact, we just saw that like the Victory Gardens, they were in the Boston Commons. So what we think of as outlandish today, you know, in, in some other periods, seems perfectly reasonable. And I think that, you know, we, we have to think, rethink what is kind of, what we consider fringe versus actually, you know, meaningful. Um, and then the last point is in terms of personal uh, doing something personally, I mean, I feel like when you run up against red tape, I, I think, you know, just sometimes it's instead of fighting against it, just turn and go that way and do something that you can do uh, that no one can really tell you you can't do. Um, so, so like riding a bike, for example, you know, and it doesn't work for everyone um, in terms of commutes. I mean, it, actually, many people, it just doesn't work. Safety issues. Uh, but if it's something that's within your control, it's like you don't have to ask anyone for it. You know? um, that's one of the reasons in, in, in my office, actually there was this solar panel and this bike generator, um, and, and my, my actual goal originally was to have this up on the roof of BU, but I quickly found that it's not a small project at all to try to do that. So I just said, well, I'll just do it in my office instead. And, you know, I didn't really have to ask anyone to do it. So, so I think sometimes it's just kind of finding that small part or some identifiable part of one's life that you can just kind of make a little project out of. And, and you know, it has some meaning, I think. So I often tell people, you know, or just suggest if, if there's just one small thing that, that can be done, I mean, it's symbolic, but like for instance, our, could you take your iPhone off the grid, let's say? I mean, our, our, our communication devices are getting smaller and more energy efficient. Could we, could our communications actually be, you know, zero carbon? You know, that's something that we have the power to do ourselves. It makes a 
solar chargers and hand crank generators and things like that. So it's a little challenge, um, but if you achieve that, it's like, wow, I, I made a, a change, a meaningful change. Okay, one last question. Uh, that, I believe, is in the U.S., and that, that 15 varieties is accounts for about 90% of the, the salt marketed apples in the United States. So it doesn't mean there's only 15 varieties. It means they take up you know, a massive amount of the market. So there's still many hundreds of varieties that are still with us. And there is, it's, I think it's, there's reason for optimism that the apple growers in places like New England because they're dealing with like this, these food mile issues and the efficiencies at which uh, apples can be transported. They're thinking about things like value added, uh, making cider out of their apples or apple butter or jelly, you know, adding value and, and they're actually, you know, some of them are doing quite well. With the rest of the world, like what's, what's going on like here at the do they go from like thousands of varieties? I think it's similar uh, with some variation. Um, you know, that area in Kazakhstan is under threat uh, in terms of land use change, so that that genetic repository diversity is under threat. That needs to be protected. Um, in Geneva, New York, we have thousands of those that were, depending on your perspective, were either pirated out of there, but there's an orchard that has thousands of those wild varieties potentially growing. So we need seed banks and we need to maintain diversity. If I could just make one addendum to Nathan's response to the previous question. The other thing Nathan has going for him is, are two things. Um, chronic optimism, which is to describe it as, and chronic stubbornness, which are two pretty positive traits in affecting change and getting things done. The other, the other comment I would make in terms of uh, Nathan describing his struggles with his office and trying to go zero carbon on the roof. Uh, I was actually the department chair at the time. And technically, you were supposed to ask me if you were going to do that. <laughs> but I don't make them long enough that, that uh, trying to struggle with them on that would be futile. So it's OK. It's all good. Um, so anyway, uh, this concludes our presentation for the evening. I want to remind everyone that the series continues in the fall. And I hope you all will join us. We'll have more and interested speakers in the fall. In the meantime, uh, please consider the alumni college and there's a reception which I'd like to